to Let's Accelerate. My name is Michael Nichols. I'm here with Uva Kirchner from Bosch Management Consulting. We are in charge of Bosch Innovation Consulting, where we look at business model innovation. Today, we have one of our very best guests. One, we go back a long time, but I will leave it to Andrew Benz to introduce himself, and we'll get into probably the topics that brought us together as we go. Excellent. Hi, Michael. Hi, Uvin. Very nice to uh, be with you today. Um, my name is Andy Bins. I lead a firm called Change Logic, uh, and we work with um, firms as they make strategic pivots um, in search of new growth. Uh, and so we get involved a lot in helping businesses set up uh, new uh, ventures, uh, helping to manage organizational transformation, things of that nature. So how did you get into corporate innovation? How did it all start? Yeah, well, it started when I was at McKinsey in the late 90s, which is kind of like um, a long time ago. And um, and I, I mentioned McKinsey now with a little trepidation as their, their halo has slipped. But in those days, uh, as a firm, we got to work um, with you know senior leaders on big problems and big issues. And one of the things that happened in the office that I was in was this uh, book was getting written called um, The Alchemy of Growth. Uh, and so set up a practice around how um, they could apply this, this model with um, corporates. Uh, and there was uh, something called the McKinsey Growth Initiative. And I remember some of the colleagues who were involved in that. Uh, and I wasn't directly in the team, but I kind of, wow, this is extraordinary stuff. I got very excited by this. And then I moved to IBM and IBM was there applying it. Um, unbeknownst to me, and I got a, uh, uh, assigned to work with the head of corporate strategy, Bruce Harold, uh, and uh, and he had brought in these two professors, one from Harvard, one from Stanford, uh, uh, to help him work on creating emerging business opportunities at IBM. Uh, and and so that sort of started my career off, and we were pretty successful at doing that. Um, um, unfortunately, IBM forgot that discipline in the interim, but that's another story. But that's how I got started on this, um, was, was that period, uh, sort of 98, 99 through to 2003. Yeah. I mean, Alchemy probably died for, for good reason. So maybe if you could summarize <laughs> what Alchemy for Growth was really all about. Yeah, they, they were talking about the three horizons of growth, the notion that um, that there's a core business in Horizon 1, there's a Horizon 3, which is your exploratory ventures, and then Horizon 2, which is probably the most misunderstood of the three, right, um, of the, the ventures that you're growing, that you're seeking to expand. Um, uh, and, and so the idea was that you would have a balanced portfolio um, and um, rather than being totally focused on optimizing your business that you have today in Horizon 1. And that sort of those the horizon thinking hasn't really died. But one of the things I always think about when I look at it, it seems like people interpret that as we do this today, we do this next, and this in fifteen yes. years. But that doesn't That's sound right. like what you said. It sounds like no. you should actually no. be doing that simultaneously. It's it's right. You're doing these three things simultaneously. And actually more than three things. It's just a framework, right? Mm -hmm. And and uh, there's this that, you know, it, it's, it doesn't, yeah. it's about managing uncertainty. And the more uncertain a business, the different types of uh, approach you need to managing it. Our basic notion is a lot of research that we've done, a lot of practice that we do with firms is you've got to separate it out. You've got to structurally separate new entities from the core business. And you don't do this because there's something, you know, nasty and evil about a core business. On the contrary, core businesses actually pay our wages. They pay your wages, right? This is important stuff, right? And you want them to drive operational execution. The thing is that the 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 logic of operational execution will exclude things which have a high level of uncertainty that aren't proven that may not turn into anything and so you need to structurally separate um, manage them differently and give them some protection uh, and that's what we learned to do at IBM with the um, the EBO program so perfect so now Christensen or O'Reilly and Trushman who's right so yeah. what about innovators dilemma Big old uh, question. And, uh, and is the ambidextrous organization, you, you somehow sort of mentioned it already, is this the answer to it? Yeah. So here's, here's, here's my, my answer to that one, which is Christiansen used to be right. <laughs> right? Okay. And, and well, you know, you think about it, at the time at which 
And I remember the first time I met Clay, actually, it was quite funny. It was, it was while I was lost uh, on the Harvard Business School campus looking for the classroom that Mike Tushman was teaching in. Um, <laughs> and then turned up and then it was Clay. And actually, he was teaching that, that class with us at IBM. And his analysis of that we all face, every company will face this moment of disruption. This is brilliant. This is like, uh, um, um, you know, Michael always says if there were a Nobel Prize in the area of uh, business, uh, then surely Clay Christensen would, would have won it several times over for this insight. But he then goes on to say that only startups can win at these moments of disruption, right? That incumbent firms will always fail when it comes to, a, to this moment when all the rules change. And I think that what we've learned is that that remains a real tension. You know, an incumbent firm struggles to change. Right? But we've all learned this lesson now. There's a lot more understanding of what it means and what the causes of that difficulty are. That, that you know, we, I think we spent a lot of time at first wrapped up in the sort of the dead end of thinking, that um, the reason why firms were disrupted was because they didn't see disruption coming, right? that, that in some way we were lacking insight. But the reality is that most of the firms that get disrupted actually have the technology already. Polaroid, at Kodak. Kodak. The, my favorite is the Swiss watch industry, right, which goes bankrupt in the 1980s and gets recovered only by um, um, uh, Hayek in, in, uh, uh, with the Swatch. But the point is that they had the, um, uh, the courts movements and they, they demoed it at, at trade shows. Right. And they deny it. And this this is now going on all over the world that firms with the technology you know, now see it. We, we now understand that it's there. We know if we just evade it and ignore it, then we're going to struggle. So we that's not good enough, nor is the notion that we sort of we see it, but we don't sort of believe the business model. We don't understand what it takes to commercialize. We, we have perhaps excessive focus on business model innovation nowadays. Right. Like this is the this is what your, your group started with. Right. This is, this is where we. So really, the third explanation is that we see it we believe it, but we can't act. And that's where I think we now are, is we have to understand what are the causes of corporate failure to act on the opportunities that they see. Right? Right. And that's where ambidexterity comes to play. Just to press you on this, you mentioned the word disruption, and, and I feel this word means many different things to very <laughs> many different people. Yeah. So when you're talking about, maybe you could clarify what Christensen meant and has that has that meaning changed over time or is it still consistent with what he originally right. meant? You know, I think that um, the, the 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 moment of disruption So, so think about any innovation in any market as being uh, about variation. There are moments when we're not sure what the um, uh, what the answer will be. Um, to a particular possibility. So uh, I used to use this example of the the ebook reader, right? There are all these different types of ebook reader out there, and we weren't sure. And then you know, Kindle came along and put it on every single device, right? And sort of sort of iterated the the thing. That moment is the moment of selection, right? Um, mm -hmm. And then you get to retention, and you optimize the innovation over time. And then disruption is the moment at which a new set of rules come along. When all of the things that made ebook reader, you know, it's Kindle stable, a stable business suddenly get changed. And you see this happen, say, with, um, you know, Uber and, and the, the very stable world of, uh, of taxi operators. Right. It would have been stable since the 1890s when London first uh, put in place a, a licensed taxi service. Right? And then all of a sudden in a few years, bang, those kinds of rules get changed. Um, and that, that's really what we mean by disruption. That the, the, and, on the other side, and on the other side is the firm sitting there with the traditional customer segments and yeah. slowly penetrating that, that segment. Absolutely. Is, is Absolutely. Really when we start talking about ambidexterity. So maybe jump on to ambidexterity, Uva. I think that yeah, exactly, exactly. There is a new book uh, from Felix Steritz. I, I don't know, it's a, I guess it's a German or Swiss person. It's called Fightback, How to Win in the Digital Economy with Platforms. Yeah, that's the title of his new book. And there is an interesting quote in there, uh, Andy. Um, he's yeah. saying, ambidextrous organizations are roughly as rare as unicorns. 
uh, that's his statement. And um, well, do you agree or do you disagree? You know, I think that there is that they are not uh, very common. Um, there, but but they do exist, right? Um, they they absolutely exist. I mean, interesting where you know it, 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 you said he's German or Swiss or um, but maybe if he was Austrian, he would go to Unica Insurance. Mm -hmm. And and Unica Insurance in in Vienna um, uh, has not only connected. Uh, it actually has two ventures operating separately from the core, right? Properly incubated, one which is um, exploring new areas of uh, new models for insurance, uh, share risk, um, and the other one is developing new business models in healthcare, Sanosex. And so this is, this is, and then this is just a, you know, it's, it's an important company, but it's not a global brand name, right? But they, they have applied that. If you go to um, uh, the German um, um, uh, engineering company, SIC, they have um, a, an emerging business group that explores and commercializes new areas uh, of business. So um, I think, and you, most of the listeners probably never heard of either of those two companies, right? My mm -hmm. point is that actually there are many ambidextrous organizations out there um, and they are being successful. What we, what we find though is that it's hard, right? So many more get started than succeed. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's the, really the, 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 the problem that, that I think we now face is that we've, we've learned the lesson about disruption. We understand that it's about how you manage the capacity to act on uh, the opportunity that you have. We start various different um, initiatives, emerging businesses, accelerators and so on. But the question is, how do we how do we improve the strike rate? How do we make it so that more of those are successful so that um, writing those kinds of things, which I believe is fair but untrue, um, becomes just slightly ridiculous. I would say something else that I think is slightly ridiculous. It is ridiculous to claim that becoming an ambidextrous organization makes you invincible, right? This is a nonsense. There is no such thing. The, 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 it, the, to apply the word invincible, right, to any organization in a world of disruption is really strange for me because it misunderstands the whole point that this is a di highly dynamic world in which your capacity to adapt is what enables you to succeed, not any notion of stability or invincibility. It doesn't exist. You should be mildly paranoid uh, as a business executive. You know, one of my clients says, um, pleased but never satisfied, right? Uh, and mm -hmm. that's the sort of the, the mindset that I think a, a business leader brings. Part of that is, I mean, when you're thinking invincible, it's like it's only thinking of the, custom, of the company side, but it forgets all customers, trends, behavioral, all of that yes. can just yes. leave the customer, the company yes. in the dirt, right? I mean, yes. that's so you can yeah. control all that, but you can only adapt. I think you've hit on something very crucial there. And another yes. thing I've I've noticed with ambidexterity, and maybe you can comment on this, is people will say things like, you know, that sounds very great in theory. It's sort of this high academic notion. It's very academic in nature, but in reality, it it won't work. What we really need is things like agile. So what are, right. your what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I'm a big fan of Agile. Um, uh, it's, um, I think, a tremendously important way of, of executing in uncertainty. Mm -hmm. you know? um, and I think that it, it works um, in, in a, a, an established business uh, and it works in an exploratory business. Right? Uh, but it is not the same. Um, to, you know, ag Agile is not a solution um, because the reason that um, it's so difficult to execute innovation inside an established business is that um, the logic is different, right? As I said before, the logic of running an operational business, the logic of running an exploratory business are different. And the people in the core business are applying good logic when they destroy the explore. Right? They are incented to drive performance efficiency. This is not bad intent that leads them to do this. This is good operational self-interest, right? Mm -hmm. And Agile can be just as liable to do that as any other management principle. Now, where it makes an enormous difference, I think, for, for, from, from, from my point of view, is, is when you do the exploratory work. So I mentioned uh, Sanosex, you know, when we help them set up the exploratory units at Sanosex, they, they run that with a series of Agile teams 
right? They um, they do customer discovery in agile teams. They do um, uh, developing um, uh, minimum viable offerings in agile teams. Um, they do um, running pilots with partners in, in agile teams, running on um, you know clear cycles, uh, having deliverables, high degree of autonomy, um, and so on. So it's 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 basically a, an excellent way of dealing with the high degree of uncertainty. I should say another place where it comes in in that example, but I've, I've um, done it at other clients such as analog devices, is that it's a way of senior leaders engaging. Right? And this is really important, is that as a senior leader, I need to be able to engage with my exploratory ventures in a different way than I do with my core. Right? I need to I need to feel this uncertainty. I need to, to feel the discovery, the sense of learning that I get when I'm working with these new businesses. And being able to do things in Agile helps them to get that sense. And I think also teaches them what might be possible back in the core business. Uh, as yeah. The more the yeah. core businesses transform, the more you're able to do that in Agile and it becomes less of a foreigner, as it were, less different. Uh, but I think there's a lot there. I have the impression again, Andy, um, in easy words, what is an ambidextrous uh, organization? I still have the, uh, coming back to Michael's question, I still have the impression that many uh, also business leaders understand this as just as a theoretical concept. So in your easy words and all your, ex your, your experience you have uh, gathered over years, sure. when it is an organization actually an, an ambidextrous organization? Three, three things, three very simple things. Firstly, that there is uh, a senior team with uh, a shared ambition for growth um, in a new area. Secondly, that they create a separate semi-autonomous unit um, to explore that uh, that ambition. And then thirdly, that the unit has the capacity to leverage the assets of the core in order to go faster than a startup. You know, so you need shared ambition, you need autonomy to act, and you need access to the resources of the core so that you can do it faster and better. Yeah, and it's what's interesting, in your, just before this question, you were mentioning you almost need a schizophrenic leader, right? You have to have this understanding that the core metrics are okay, right? They're perfect for the core business. But when you go over to this semi-autonomous unit, you're asking things such as, what have you learned, right? And you may not be asking for EBIT, right? Or, or revenue yesterday, <laughs> like, like the tendency. Right. You may right. be asking like, really, what have we learned about our business uh, over the last year? And what are we gonna learn over the next two years? So it's a fundamentally different way of thinking. Yeah, the, I, I haven't thought of um, of uh, suggesting schizophrenia as a way to this. Um, I, we talk about how do you manage ambiguity, right? And and, mm -hmm. and how do you think about um, uh, living with uncertainty? Um, uh, I find that many CEOs really get this quickly, and what they lack is a way of operationalizing that. Um, and that's what we are privileged to be able to to to, to bring them. Um, it is true that as you go a layer or two below, that's more challenging. Um, to to and it tends to be the characteristic of of the really successful CEOs that they ha are happily live in in uh, in ambiguity. Smart um, and, and this is effectively devices a, connected. A, effectively a way of of managing that. Um, you know, it's um, uh, so. You know the 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 role of the leader in this is critical without any any question however i don't think we should overemphasize it to the point where nothing else matters right um yes you have this sort of um capacity to act question can you step up when it matters to commit right but um what i also think is a problem is if um is if people in the rest of the organization kind of don't do anything imagining that the leader won't have the capacity to act, right? Some of the the, the best examples of the uh, explore business unit, or what I like to call corporate explorers, that they actually start in the business and they earn the license to build the business by taking the case to some powerful sponsor, right? When we there, there's this example of um, of uh, Unico and Sharisk, this manager of the business in Hungary. Right, which is nobody's idea of a major you know business unit right i mean it's a significant country and significant business but it's not you know mega right but he comes up with a uh, with a concept which which you know has the risk of uh, the potential to destabilize the entire insurance industry and he says hey, why don't we do this 
And they're like, but that's a nuclear bomb underneath our business. That's the quote from the CEO. Why would we do this? Well, because if we don't, somebody else would. Will. And I'm like, okay, we should learn about this. Right. And so he brings that opportunity. And the way he does that is very sophisticated and nuanced. Um, and obviously he rests on on having a leadership group that I think are pretty enlightened. But but there are lots of that, that man's name is Christian Curtis. There are lots of Christian Curtis's out there. Right. You know, I've just been working uh, this this last week with uh, a leader um, uh, 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 at a firm in, in the US, a tech firm in the US, where we started five years ago. And I remember the moment he walked into the room and said, hey, I have this idea that I never get any time to work on. Right. And he sketched out this business for doing uh, condition based monitoring of machines with predictive analytics. And now he has a business. And that's his full time job. Right. And he that because he advocated for it with facts and with uh, customer insight and with um, with the ability to validate uh, the opportunity. So, you know, it, it, it's 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 yes, it's about leadership, but it's also about like leadership at the top. But it's also about leadership from these corporate explorers. Right. And 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 the, so there are lots and lots of people out there who need the the sort of the method, the equipment and also a little bit of the courage to be able to articulate these cases to leaders who, by the way, are desperate to hear from them at some level. When I go into CEO, this is their problem. It's like, I need my team to be able to do this. I need my team to be able to um, to to build new businesses, to, to have the uh, you know the curiosity be about customer problems we can solve and the, the ambition to want to build a business that matters to us. Right. So uh, I think there's a there's there's a there's a need to get both sides of this equation together. Is there ever a time when ambidexter is not the answer, when it's not appropriate to be ambidextrous? Yeah, yeah. So, so this is a um, um, the, where the innovation you're dealing with is a substitution for the core. Then you have dynamics that can be quite challenging if you try to run the two side by side. So um, I, I think an example of this would be, um, we worked with um, the um, online legal information company, LexisNexis, number of years ago. And, and they, they replaced their entire technology um, infrastructure and they have this really advanced product now called Lexus Advance for, 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 um, for legal insights. And, and that platform was basically a substitution, right? Mm -hmm. and so although there were some units who were developing new value propositions around mm -hmm. the platform, for the most part, you couldn't run that as a separate entity, right? So it also makes sense. Go on. Great. Yeah, is this also true for disruptive technologies? So we have you have technology A, like in the automotive industry, and that's replaced by a new industry. Would you also say ambidextrity is ambidextrity is not the answer there? Yes. Yeah. So um, th th there's there's a rule here, which is that does the innovation have the potential um, to be competence destroying in the mm -hmm. core business? Right. Mm -hmm. So if you think about or is it competence enhancing? If you think about um, radio to TV um, mm -hmm. to online news, right? Mm -hmm. Radio to TV, it's competence enhancing. We can have radio stations and TV stations in the same company, totally different format, but same, but it works together. We go to online news and we just destabilize the advertising model, so therefore the fundamental how they make money. We change the way that news is consumed, who provides it. There's, there's you know, not only specialist journalists, but, you know, anybody can can um, generate the news, the people themselves, you know, the, the characters in the news, like politicians, I'm speaking from the US, so we, we, we have experienced that, uh, themselves can generate news by their own channel. So this is totally destabilized, right? This does become competence destroying to existing news organizations. Right? And I think you've got to puzzle that out for automotive as well. So mm -hmm. to, to what degree is the uh, is the technology competence destroying and does running, um, you know, having a history of running, you know, gasoline powered, manually operated, owner operated vehicles, is it threatened by, you know, um, a, 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 a autonomous a, a electric ride share? I mean, in some cases, yes, and in some cases, no. Right. Um, I guess so. something uh, car manufacturers have to have to sort out. 
Looking at the time, you're already coming to the end uh, of our uh, podcast, and it's a tradi tradition, uh, Andy, to finish off um, our podcast with a sentence completion exercise. So I'm going to uh, start. I thought it was going to be a song. Um, you know. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, yeah, as, as we want to be innovative, innovative, and I think we are, maybe this is something we shall do in the future. Well, let's stick to the exercise. So I start a sentence, and if you could finish off that one. Okay, let's give it a try. Future corporate senior leaders will be successful if? Uh, they see managing uncertainty and ambiguity as their core role. Excellent. The next company to master ambidexterity will be? Bosch. When the pandemic is over, the first place I will visit will be? Uh, London. <laughs> <laughs> thought you were going to come to Stuttgart and visit us. <laughs> As an Good. Englishman, not in New York, but in the US, I, I totally understand this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, a, that's the, your way of saying no comment. <laughs> yes, <it's like laughs> yeah. You know, when the pandemic ends, there's going to be such opportunity in so many parts of the world. Uh, it's going to be a crazy time, I think. I predict a, there's such pent up demand, there's so much, dis, uh, you know, so destabilized. Uh, not only is there human suffering, but there's like economic dislocation. And I and I think we better hold our hats and, and we will be very busy helping firms figure out how they can win in what will be an extremely, uh, uh, um, you know, unusual economic and social situation. And so I have no idea where I'll be because, you know, I'll go wherever my clients call. Thank you so much for your time today. It has been a pleasure having you, you on our podcast. Thanks a lot. Talk to you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation.